Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Douglas Schinkel. I am the uh, Transportation Program Director here at the National Conference of State Legislatures. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, this is the fourth webinar in a five webinar series celebrating the 30th anniversary of the American with Disabilities Act, the ADA. Um, the last webinar in the series is tomorrow and I'll talk more about that at the end of the webinar. Uh, we also encourage you to check out the latest episode of NCSL's podcast, which is called Our American States. That features an interview with former Iowa Senator Tom Harkin, and he tells the story about how the ADA basically made it to the president's desk. Um, we have an audience chat box um, that I'd like to alert you to that you're encouraged to use. Um, we have set aside time later in the session for question and answer, and also encourage you to kind of just communicate with each other through that. Um, this webinar will be posted on the NCSL website as soon as it is um, made available to us and we will be passing along an email um, alerting you to that and passing along some other associated resources. Um, the focus of today's webinar is the impact of the ADA on transportation accessibility. Uh, the ADA requires both public and private transportation providers to provide um, to meet ADA requirements and ensure access to their stations, vehicles, et cetera. And while enormous progress has been made as the result of the ADA, um, I think the hard reality is that there are, there are still some a ways to go. And, and we'll hear, I think, a little bit about that today, about some of the promise the ADA and some of a lot of that has come to fruition, but there are still some, some challenges out there. Uh, for example, almost all transit vehicles in the nation are now um, ADA compliant, but many of the transit stations um, are not. Um, the ADA also requires every path of travel in and around a facility, including streets, sidewalks, and curb ramps. Um, but as you all probably know, there are some communities that do not have sidewalks at all, or they may not be in um, great shape, and there's a lack of curb ramps in many places. So a lot of things to work on. Um, so many state and local governments continue to work um, with, with um, advocates representing people with disabilities uh, to try and improve accessibility and the reliability of transportation systems and infrastructure. So we have an outstanding lineup of speakers with us today. We have Carol Tyson with the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. We have Sarah Davidson with Intelligent Transportation Society of America, ITS America. We have Dustin Jones, uh, president and founder of United for Equal Access New York. And we have Tennessee State Senator Becky Duncan Massey um, batting cleanup. But first, we have a very special video message for you. Um, U.S. Uh, Department of Transportation, U.S. DOT Secretary Elaine Chow was um, gracious enough to provide a video. Um, and so we're going to run that in a moment. Um, she is the second, uh, this is Secretary Chow's second cabinet position. She served as the U.S. Secretary of Labor from 2001, 2009, and um, is the first Asian American woman to ever be appointed to a president's cabinet. She began her executive career in public service, working on transportation issues in the House. Um, she's also served as Deputy, Deputy Secretary of the U.S. of Transportation um, back in the Bush administration. As U.S. Secretary of Transportation, she's a strong advocate for safety and the importance of infrastructure and innovation in our nation's economic competitiveness and growth. As the U.S. Secretary of Labor, she focused on increasing the competitiveness of Americans' workforce um, and a global economy, promoted job training, and set new records in workplace safety and health. So we're very happy to have her here and to provide this video. So, Scott, if you could run that video. Thanks for gathering for this virtual meeting on the Americans with Disabilities Act and transportation. State legislators know better than anyone that much of the hard work of building, maintaining, and operating transportation systems that ensure accessibility to people with disabilities falls on state and local governments. Expanding opportunities for people with disabilities 
has always been a core belief of mine. As Secretary of Labor, I directed the Bureau of Labor Statistics to collect employment data on people with disabilities. This helped the world gain a better understanding of the labor market experience of people with disabilities and how to better serve those who want to fully participate in the workforce. As Secretary of Transportation, increasing access to transportation for people with disabilities has continued to be a priority. In 2017, 25.5 million Americans have disabilities that make traveling outside the home difficult. This impacts employment, quality of life, and access to medical care. We are fortunate to be living in an era of innovation in which new technology has the potential to increase transportation access, especially for the elderly and people with disabilities. New technology to increase mobility access is being developed with the help of the department. And these systems included various types of automated vehicles. The department is tripling the funding for accessibility research. At last year's summit, the department announced almost $50 million in new initiatives to develop and deploy innovations in technology and advance interagency partnerships to improve mobility. This year, the department helped implement $25 billion to help the nation's public transportation system respond to COVID-19. These funds are helping keep paratransit services running so that people with disabilities can get to the workplace, the doctor's office, the grocery store, and all the destinations that they need and want to get to. Later this month, the department will announce several new initiatives, including a new research grant focused on automated vehicles and mobility services for people with disabilities. We look forward to working with you to help usher in a new era of freedom, inclusion, and mobility for people with disabilities. Take care. Hello, everyone, and thank, thank you to Secretary Chow for providing that video. Um, it's really exciting, the leadership she's providing and some of the uh, exciting initiatives coming out of the USDOT. One of the programs she mentioned, that Mobility for All Projects um, uh, program, just released um, their list of grantees, 17 grantees across the country, and I encourage you to take a look at those. There's some interesting models. I'll quickly mention a few of them. The Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation is going to receive money to develop an online um, directory of transportation services. Uh, the Maryland Transit Administration will receive funding to hire a mobility man manager who will increase transportation uh, coordination for people with disabilities. Uh, there's some programs in D.C., New Orleans, rural Mor Missouri, and Eugene, Oregon will work to improve access to transportation for health and medical employment. So I think th those are some of the models that we will take a look at and keep an eye on and see if there's some kind of best practices we can share with you in the next year or two. So kudos to the USDOT for those exciting efforts. And thanks again to Secretary Chow and the USDOT Secretary Office for providing that. Um, so let's now turn to our next speakers for this session, uh, Carol Tyson and Dustin Jones. Uh, Carol will provide an overview of recent policy and legal developments related to accessible transportation and share some success stories from state and local governments. Uh, Dustin uh, has a pre-recorded video sharing his personal experiences navigating New York's uh, city's transportation system and that how, has, how that has informed his advocacy work um, to improve access to numerous forms of transportation 
in the New York metro, in New York City metro area. Um, Carol, uh, I'm going to introduce both of them, and then we'll just go over into both their presentations. Carol is uh, someone we've worked with before, so thanks for joining us again, Carol. Uh, she's the Government Affairs Liaison for the Dis Disability Rights, Education, and Defense Fund, a National Law and Policy Center with offices in Washington, D.C. and Berkeley, California. Uh, Tyson provides an advocate voice in the district and works in coalition with disability and civil rights partners and industry st stakeholders focusing on transportation equity, healthcare, supports and services needed to remain in the community, and civil rights. Uh, prior to joining um, DREDF, uh, Tyson served as the Director of Disability Policy for United Spinal Association, was where I actually first met her. Uh, she has served on transportation com committees addressing on-demand transportation, bicycle and pedestrian safety, equity and accessibility issues. And in 2014, she received the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority uh, Dr. Rosalind Simon Award uh, in recognition of advancing the field of accessible transportation through education, training, and advocacy. And from everything I know of Carol, she is richly deserving of that. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Carol to give her presentation. We'll be able to ask questions of her later in the virtual session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doug, and thank you to NCSL for the opportunity to speak with you all today, uh, to my fellow panelists for their leadership, and to Secretary Chow and USDOT for their commitment to inclusion. I need my slides. Hey. So uh, Doug mentioned that JREF is a legal and policy center led by people with disabilities and parents of children with disabilities. DREDF seeks a just world where all people with and without disabilities live full and independent lives free of discrimination. We believe firmly that access to transportation for all is a civil right. In 1990, Congress passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA. In that act, they found that disabilities in no way diminish a person's right to fully participate in all aspects of society that society has tended to isolate and segregate individuals with disabilities who continually encounter various forms of discrimination, including transportation barriers. The ADA's mission is to provide a clear and comprehensive national mandate for the elimination of discrimination. Today, the ADA protects nearly one in four people in the US who have a disability, that's up to 61 million. People with disabilities are twice as likely to live in poverty and have insufficient access to healthcare and services. Safe and reliable access to mobility for disabled travelers can be vastly different depending on our income, our race, gender, religion, immigration and LGBTQ status, and whether we live in an urban versus rural or tribal setting. Lack of transportation has been found to be the disparity for people with disabilities. Doug mentioned that 99% of buses are accessible. That's amazing. <laughs> it took 30 years to get here. Yet, inaccessible architecture, modes, technology, and attitudinal barriers remain. Many bus stops, sidewalks, and transit stations are accessible. Infrastructure improvements are needed in low-income neighborhoods, and disabled Black, Indigenous, and people of color who walk, roll, bike, or drive are at risk of being racially profiled. Transit agencies in some cities uh, were cutting bus routes before COVID, <laughs> which decreases paratransit service areas. Most ride-hailing, Uber and Lyft, bike share and scooters are inaccessible and relying on them as backup transportation during emergencies can create bigger access gaps. Limiting transit access during emergencies and policies extending restaurant service on sidewalks can exacerbate existing access barriers. And finally, many Amtrak stations remain inaccessible, including state-owned facilities. That's a lot of doom and gloom, but all hope is not lost. There are steps we can take to address existing barriers and uphold the promise of the ADA. Can identify access gaps and fully utilize resources that are available. 
possible, adopting new mobility performance measures and collecting data. Can identify paratransit deserts in your state, survey your state's sidewalks, curb cuts, roads in rural areas and bus stops, measure access to affordable accessible housing, jobs, and environmental justice impacts of projects. Work with the mobility managers in your state and fully utilize Section 5310 funds for of way improvements, travel training, accessible vehicles, and other projects that go above and beyond the ADA's requirements. You can look to the Seattle Data Collection for their four higher vehicles and plans statewide survey of their sidewalks and curb cuts that they did in 2017 as best practices. You can also message equity and commit by developing equity principles for projects in collaborating with the disability community. Consider maintenance of effort policies in transit and state services. Require accessibility plans and accessible service in partnership micromobility ride handling operators. Establish a state accessibility, equity, or sustainable mobility office. And most of all, provide a seat at the head of the table for community members with disabilities or accessibility work. And you can even hire people with disabilities for those projects. For best practices, I recommend looking to the Seattle Transit Equity Program, SFMTA's Equity Principles, Michigan's 2018 Planet M AV Grants Stakeholder Process, and Tennessee's new Office for Accessibility. I've compiled some resources uh, if you request these slides for later on the disability history and ADA uh, currently issues, including a letter sent from disability advocates to governors on their response to COVID-19 and transportation, uh, and a lot of links on autonomous vehicle advocacy. I've also listed links to the best practice examples that I referenced. I truly believe that equitable mobility is possible. We are in a moment of reimagining. We can work together to uphold the promise of ADA. We just need to hold each other and ourselves accountable to principles of justice and equity. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, for that presentation. As always, you gave us a nice summation of some of the um, kind of current challenges, but some of the kind of promising policies and practices out there. Um, I'm intrigued to learn a little bit more about how Massachusetts was able to do a survey of all the sidewalks in their state, because that's a pretty significant undertaking. So I'm gonna definitely look into that a little bit more. Thanks for sharing that. And one of the um, uh, models that uh, Carol mentioned, the Tennessee Office of Accessible Transportation, uh, we'll hear more about that from the bill sponsor, Senator Massey, a little bit later in the presentation. So let's now, let me quickly introduce Dustin. We haven't been able to have Dustin join us on live yet, but he does have a pre-recorded video. Uh, Dustin Jones is president and founder of United for Equal Access New York, and he's a bit of an internet celebrity. You may have seen some of his videos online showing the travails and just kind of what he has to go through to try and get around uh, New York by subway, by bus, by navigating the sidewalks, um, taxis, et cetera. Um, Dustin started advocating for transportation um, access and housing for people with disabilities after losing a foot in a surgery in March of 2011. Um, since that time, he has sat on the board of Disabled in, Action of, in, Disabled in Action of Metropolitan New York, and he currently serves on the board of Sydney Center for Independence of the Disabled New York. Uh, so with that, let's run uh, Dustin's video. Hello, my name is Dustin Jones. I'm 32 years old, and I'm a disability rights activist from New York City. First of all, thank you for having me here. I wanna to talk to you about something very special today, transportation. But not just transportation as a whole, transportation for people with disabilities. We in this country are lacking when it comes to transportation for people with disabilities. We have limited access to move around like anybody else. Why is that? Well, I feel like we're not brought to the conversation very often or even at all. I feel a lot of people have these conversations about what they want to do with our transit system 
but they don't include us and they want to do things without us. We need to put a stop to that. We have something like the ADA that's supposed to protect us. And the ADA does work. It's a blessing to have. However, it needs enforcement. I mean, let's face it. If we don't have robust transportation for everybody, how is it that someone like myself or anybody with a disability will be able to go to school, have a successful job, go to a doctor's appointment, or even go and have fun with some friends? We can't. Because most of us who are lucky enough to even have transportation that we can use, we constantly find little hiccups, like not every station in your subway has an elevator. Why is that? Constantly, there's so much construction going on. Why is it that no one is thinking, especially in this day and age, 2020, let's put an elevator here or a ramp. Let's make sure that everybody can fit in this station. Let's make it inclusive. I feel the only way things like that is going to happen is if people like myself are brought in the conversation to the forefront. I feel that's the only way we're going to have a, trans a transportation system that is accessible for everyone. In addition, I also feel like affordability is something we need to talk about. Now, we're living in a very trying time these days. And I feel if you have a transportation system that you can't afford to use, then why even bother? Most people with disabilities live on a fixed income. I feel that if we're going to talk about having accessible transportation for all, I feel that we should also talk about having affordable transportation for people with disabilities. So that way we don't have to be nervous riding around the transit system wondering, can we get from point A to point B because either one, we can't afford it or we don't have any access. I feel that these changes are definitely gonna be what helps bring us into the next future of transportation systems. I feel that that's gonna be the goal to elevate us to the next level and allow us to be more inclusive in the uh, community. In conclusion, I would like to say thank you for having me. I hope this brief analysis of what happens to people with disabilities or what can continue to happen to people with disabilities can, can do if we don't do something about it first. Thank you. Thank you for that. We really appreciate Dustin taking the time to put that together and for Carol for her assisting with that. We thought it was important to hear kind of the first town account of kind of what it's like to experience um, having to navigate some of America's transportation systems um, when you do have a disability. And um, Dustin's doing some really important work in New York City, so we thank him for that. Um, Next, we're gonna kind of move towards looking towards the future and specifically the prospects, prospect of a driverless car future. Um, as some of you may know, um, there are autonomous um, vehicle transportation services that already exist out there. There are shuttles in, in different cities across the US and in the Phoenix metro area, Waymo is providing rides to a small cohort of of passengers and so this is maybe something that is not as far away in the future as we maybe think it is and it obviously has incredibly important implications for people with disabilities um, and it's important I think that we get things right on the front ends. Um, so we have a great speaker with us today, Sarah Davison, to discuss um, what considerations must be made to ensure a driverless future um, accommodates people with disabilities. Sarah was the co-author of a 2019 report entired, entitled Driverless Cars and Accessibility, and she is going to share some of the findings with us. Uh, Sarah Davidson is a technical lead at the Intelligent Transportation Society of America, ITS America. Uh, Sarah conducts extensive research and analysis pertaining to connected and automated vehicles, mobility on demand, smart city technology, and a range of other topics. 
Um, and so with that, um, Sarah has a pre-recorded video, so let's run that and then we'll hear from her during the Q&A. My name is Sarah Davidson and I'm a technical lead for smart systems at ITS America. I will be talking today about the topic of AVs and accessibility. Thank you again to NCSL for inviting me to speak and for facilitating today's discussion. So the topic today that I'll be presenting on is AVs and accessibility. My presentation will be focusing on accessibility considerations for automated vehicles. Um, primarily looking at uh, takeaways from a report that uh, ITS America published, co-authored by myself and my former colleague Steve Bayless um, last year on the topic of driverless cars and accessibility. This report was funded by the National Institute on Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research and the Administration for Community Living, conducted as a project of the University of California, San Francisco. So automated vehicles are a hot topic in the transportation um, universe these days. They offer potentially an opportunity to alleviate mobility barriers, particularly for those who perhaps um, are unable to drive or for those who have relied on uh, accessible vehicles, which there is sometimes a lack of. Um, AVs potentially offer an opportunity for individuals with disabilities. Um, to age in place and travel more independently. And roughly 18.7% uh, of the US population uh, reports having a disability according to the 2010s uh, US Census. So this potentially could help a lot of people. However, um, the degree to which AVs are able to benefit um, members of the disabilities community depends on how early and to what extent the vehicle manufacturers take uh, accessibility into consideration in the design process of their vehicles. So for um, our report on driverless vehicles and accessibility, we interviewed and met with a range of participants. In addition to representatives from, um, from automakers, ride sharing and technology companies and public agencies, we also um, looked to a wide range of individuals from the disabilities community, including those with permanent uh, communicative disabilities, such as those with difficulties seeing, hearing, and speaking, um, individuals with permanent physical disabilities, including those uh, using mobility aid devices, and, and those uh, who may be experiencing conditional impairment, for example, those injured, including veterans, uh, older adults and others. We also included represent, re representatives from um, organizations re representing a wide range of um, disabilities. Oh, and just as an additional note, um, I'll be providing a summary of some of the findings from the report, but if you'd like to read the report in full or learn more details, it's available um, at the ITS America website or you can reach out to me and I will provide my contact information at the end of this presentation. So universal design was one of the um, key things mentioned in our meetings uh, with individuals uh, from the disabilities community. Universal design uh, is technology design that can accommodate the widest range of potential users, including people with disabilities. So costs, um, often vehicles are not built to accommodate all needs and abilities, and this has led to um, a lot of retrofitting, which can be inhibitive or otherwise problematic for users, um, and uh, associated expensive, uh, expenses can then uh, be a barrier to mobility. To avoid the need to always retrofit, the disabilities community urges um, that universal design concepts be taken into consideration at early stages in AV development and deployment. Um, and just for your reference, an example of universal design might be for like a curb cut uh, at the edge of a sidewalk, rather than being steeply sloped, it's uh, gradually sloped so that someone in uh, a wheelchair, for example, can go down safely. But this also benefits, uh, for example, people pulling luggage or um, people pushing a stroller. So universal design can not only help those with um, a disability, it potentially can benefit all users. So there's a lot of value 
to incorporating uh, universal design. So with um, AVs and for the, with, um, in the context of this discussion, I am referring to level four and five uh, uh, automation, i.e. highly automated vehicles that don't require the passenger to take control of the vehicle during the ride. Um, for this reason, uh, users or riders perhaps would not require a driver's license. Uh, given that these vehicles could be driverless, um, there's opportunities to potentially remove the driver cockpit, the steering wheel, um, pedals, et cetera. This could open up new opportunities to accommodate riders, um, including rethink how we allocate space um, for seating and for wheelchair users. So in these images on the screen, you can see pictures of Toyota's e palette and Local Motors Ollie. And you can see that there's space in these vehicles, not only for standing passengers, but also for um, you know, several wheelchair users and they're designed for easy onboarding and offboarding. Uh, it's important that these vehicles be designed in a simple um, user-friendly and intuitive way so that they are accessible to the widest range of users possible. Another important um, aspect of making AVs accessible is uh, accessible interfaces. Interfaces that enable the unambiguous exchange of information between AVs and travelers are critical. So um, depending on what a user's need might be, they might need uh, audible alerts, they might need a visual version of an alert or a haptic alert. Um, someone who's unable to uh, hear alerts needs a visual alert option that they can see, for example, even if they're not um, looking at a screen, it needs to be able to catch their attention so that they're able to ride safely um, in the case of needing to receive travel information for any reason. Um, additionally, when considering accessible interfaces, uh, perhaps voice recognition software or gesture recognition software would be an asset to individuals who have trouble with fine motor control or um, who have difficulty with speech. Um, considering interfaces in a very versatile um, light so that they can accommodate the widest range of users will help to enable um, AVs not to leave any uh, types of travelers out. Um, so the bottom line with this is collaboration and making sure that these vehicles are um, accessible to a wide range of Users will help to make sure that there are no gaps in mobility um, or safety in, during the ride. So speaking of no gaps in mobility, the concept of the complete trip, um, and this is an image by the US DOT, and what the complete trip is, is it's highlighting the point that for a ride in an AV to be accessible and for someone to be able to ride independently, not only does the ride itself have to be accessible, um, but the beginning and end of the trip also need to be accessible. This could be um, getting alerts that your ride has arrived, uh, going out to the vehicle and onboarding, and also exiting to your destination at the end. So within the context of AVs, some concerns that were highlighted by the accessibility, um, the disabilities community include, um, for instance, that low vision and blind users mention challenges associated with wayfinding and navigation or otherwise reaching their vehicle or destination independently. Um, additionally, for ingress and egress, uh, avoiding risks associated with exposure to obstacles like street furniture and traffic. Um, and en route, as we mentioned, um, could be anything from occupant protection and securement of wheelchairs, uh, to being able to you know, safely sit and um, be able to access your belongings and make sure you can get seated by yourself in the vehicle. And all of these things present challenges that should be taken into consideration when um, designing a vehicle. Uh, for this reason, it is really important to include members of the um, disabilities community in conversations uh, as the vehicles are being developed so that the design from the start uh, is built to accommodate the widest range of users. Um, and as a last comment, another additional uh, 
uh, element that would be helpful is the availability of detailed data. Um, for example, traffic data, position data, information on signs and route related information, all of that and associated assistive uh, devices can be beneficial for a more safe sleep trip. Um, some additional considerations about AVs and accessibility um, include that it is important that the AVs be accessible and accommodate um, not only passengers inside the vehicle, but also a diverse type of road users. So um, as a person crosses an intersection, it is important that the AV be able to communicate effectively with um, that individual crossing the street, regardless of whether they have you know, any hearing impairment or vision impairment, et cetera. Associated standards and policies, therefore, will be critical. Um, additionally, uh, it is worth considering the way that these vehicles may be deployed. Uh, you know, it might be a ride sharing model like Uber and Lyft. It also might be a micro transit model like you see with Via, where these vehicles are used as shuttles with other individuals um, as passengers. This could actually help to alleviate some of the initial challenges associated with the absence of a driver, um, as many individuals with a physical disability currently rely on a driver to help assist them with onboarding. Um, and obviously, aiming towards independent onboarding is the goal. Um, but as, this, as these vehicles are developed, having some other either a, a assistance on the vehicle could be beneficial, um, though it is important that these vehicles be accessible from the start. Moving forward, um, in addition to a need for associated training and resources uh, so that people can learn how to use these vehicles safely, um, one of the underlying factor, one of the underlying messages stated by uh, our participants was nothing about us without us. Accessible design is critical for mobility for all. Um, it's therefore important that we rethink and adapt standards and policies as we reconsider vehicle design and um, the need for certain types of user interfaces. And as we continue to develop more um, different models and pilots for AVs across the country, um, there will be different opportunities to test out various uh, approaches to providing service and AVs so that these vehicles can be safe and user friendly. Uh, and I look forward to seeing how these technologies in evolve with you. Uh, if you have any questions about our research at ITS America, um, please feel free to reach out to me at sdavidson at itsa.org. Um, and thank you again to NCSL. Thank you very much to Sarah for joining us. Um, that was a really excellent overview of the report that she co-authored, and we appreciate her joining us via recording. She will be on um, live in a moment. I think what we're going to do now is let's pull the audience and see what you think um, about this topic. So we're going to put up a survey question. Um, it asks, in your opinion, uh, so Scott, if you could pull up the survey question, it says, in your opinion, what is the biggest barrier to accessibility to autonomous vehicles for people with disabilities? And there's five options to choose from there. So please choose one of them, and then I'll, we'll take a quick look at how the results come in. Um, Yes, and Scott, please do send the results to the audience or I can hit it right there. So a lot of folks commenting on the affordability. We're still getting some more people chiming in. So I'm gonna to continue to look at these as they come in in real time. That's interesting. So you're, you're seeing maybe a little less concern about the design and a lot of discussion about the affordability, which is I think something that's maybe in, um, not maybe discussed as much as, as you would think. So Sarah, um, do you wanna weigh in on, on these responses? Any, any initial reactions to what you're seeing here? 
Sure. So the affordability concern is one that was voiced um, in the interviews that we we did, and this is also underlies um, the importance of considering how uh, AVs might be deployed. Um, for instance, rather than personally owned vehicles, uh, which could be inhibitively expensive, uh, fleet deployment um, could help to make the service more accessible. Um, again, also the importance of not relying on retrofitting. Um, for making uh, AVs accessible in the future would be an important part of having them be affordable to all. And I see that the second most selected item is vehicle onboarding and offboarding. And this is also consistent with the interviews we conducted. Thank you very much, Sarah. And a good point about the fleet kind of considerations that need to be, um, you know, if you do these things at the front end, maybe that's gonna make it cheaper and it's gonna make a profit, profit model that, that makes more sense. And maybe there's more potentiality for some public-private partnerships. Speaking of which, let us go to our last speaker in batting cleanup, and thank you for being patient, is uh, Senator Becky Duncan Massey. Um, Senator Massey was elected to the 6th Senatorial District in 2011. She serves a Senate Transportation Committee and also um, serves on the Health and Safety Committee. She previously served as Secretary for the Senate Republican Caucus. There you are. Thanks for joining us, Senator Massey. Uh, Senator Massey retired from the Sertoma Center um, after 24 years, having served as the Executive Director there uh, in Knoxville. The center serves adults with an intellectual disabilities, provide, providing vocational and lift skills training, mental health supports, and residential services. Uh, Sarah Massey is going to shed some light on her transportation accessibility work in the Tennessee General Assembly, including some exciting new legislation from 2020. So with that, uh, Sarah Massey, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug, for having me. And, and, and it's an honor to be with everyone here today. Um, this past year, we did pass the Tennessee Accessible Transportation and Mobility Act of 2020. Every good piece of legislation needs a good name. But uh, basically what this new law does, is it creates the Office of Accessible Transportation in Tennessee's Department of Transportation that is dedicated to improving and expanding accessible transportation. It builds on and improves transportation services that offer more opportunities for people with disabilities and older adults to access health care, gainful employment, social activities, and faith communities, to name a few. Transportation is not an amenity. It's life support for people who need it to access groceries, dialysis, and jobs. Around the country, transportation remains the top barrier to inclusion for people with disabilities and people who are aging. Current research confirms that significant barriers to employment and community inclusion persist because of lack of accessible transportation, despite the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act 30 years ago, actually this weekend, this Sunday is the 30th anniversary. It, in communities around the country, Patchworks of funding programs and resulting transportation services exist to meet the needs of these individuals, but the end user has difficulty navigating this complex menu of transportation options in their community. In Tennessee, as I sure I'm, I'm sure it's in most states, this has traditionally been provided and coordinated at the local level. Accessibility looks different depending upon where you live, whether you're in rural communities or urban areas, and it's harder to find or it's not as reliable in some communities uh, than others. The need for statewide support of a coordinated and accessible transportation was recognized by a coalition of state disability organizations after hearing many stories from Tennesseans with disabilities about the need for better access, accessible transportation options. Um, some examples were that, you know, they talked about when in, in person with me or in committee hearings was they would take, um, they would be trying to go to their doctor, but it'd be in the next county over and the, the ride would stop at the county line and then they'd have to pick up Uber the last little bit. There was, or they would take them and drop them off at the wrong place. Um, also, um, I had actually a friend whose daughter um, 
was uh, um, was accepted into a really good paying job, but she couldn't afford the transportation to take her to it. So there's issues like that continue to exist. Members of the coalition approached me, and with my background at Sir Thomas Center and as a disability provider, I knew the historical challenges and was excited about uh, sponsoring the bill. The partners working on the legislation in Tennessee included the Tennessee Council on Developmental Disabilities, the ARC, the Disability Rights Tennessee, and the Tennessee Department of Transportation. While we ultimately passed the bill unanimously in both houses, uh, as was any bills, we had to work through some issues. At first, TDOT, our Department of Transportation, did not see the need for this new office as they already had a multimodal division. We explained that while this unit draws down federal funds for accessible transportation needs, these funds are designed to target localities and not entire regions or statewide initiatives. What we needed was coordination between the counties and regionally. As usual, we had to address the funding for the staff positions and the operations of the office. It was determined in our case that we were not drawing down all of our federal transit administration program funds and that this could be used to fund the office. We also tried to not be too prescriptive to give the commissioner of transportation the ability to set up the office as he best determined. Uh, but we wanted to set up the structure for the work so that it could be sustained for years to come. What this legislation does uh, is offer a new sustained level of support to localities across Tennessee already tackling these issues. It says that by March 31st, 2021, the office will produce and share with the General Assembly a mission statement in scope of responsibilities, a five-year strategic plan, and then also an annual report about accessible transportation in Tennessee. The, um, they will convene an advisory committee of stakeholders that includes experts in transportation, aging and disabilities, and people that, that use accessible transportation. They will work with this advisory group to identify how the needs are being met and, um, and where the gaps are in services. The report will outline these needs and then possible solutions. As this will change over time, they will produce this report annually. The law states that government agencies coordinate with TDOT toward the goal of expanding and approving improving accessible transportation and mobility across Tennessee. Some of the possible solutions might include memorandums of understanding between counties and also the development of public-private pri partnerships to meet these needs. These, uh, there will also be the ability to uh, look for increased funding or even possible grants for these services. We are excited to be the very first state to offer this dedicated office and look forward to building on and improving transportation services that offer more opportunities for people with disabilities and older adults to access health care, economic opportunity, self-sufficiency, and community. Thank you, Senator Massey. I appreciate that. Um, exciting news. Um, we will send out, we will make sure that we send out, uh, when we send the webinar slides, we will send a link to Senator Massey's bill. She touched on a lot of important things, coordination, thinking about how incredibly frustrating it would be to be in the situation she laid out where you're, you get to a county line and then you, um, you know, you change jurisdictions and that um, upends your travel plans. I think obviously most of us don't have to deal with that. So we have to really appreciate the struggles that folks have to sometimes go through. Um, I'm glad you referenced that the um, the new office is funded partially, it sounds, by 5310 funds. Um, you know, for Correct. other states, something to check is whether whether your states are actually expending all these funds, and some of them may be available, and you, you may be surprised. Um, so um, I really appreciate you kind of weighing in, Senator Massey, with all the, all, all the work you're doing in um, on these issues, I know you've been active on this for a long time. Is there any words of advice for you have for other states, Senator Massey, in terms of other states trying to kind of think about 
um, how to approach this? I mean, you certainly laid out a lot of um, helpful information there, but anything else to add? Well, I think the important part is, is to find your partners to work with on it. Um, see what you're doing in Tennessee, but find those partners, the coalitions and, and the, the disability advocates that can help, help you with working the bill and advocating for the bill, bringing in uh, consumers that are actually affected by the disruption of, of transportation. So I think that will, you know, that will help you in working the bill. Uh, I know a lot of legislators don't have the background that I have had in as a disability provider, but uh, even in that, there's so many different kinds of disabilities that, you know, it's always good to um, have, have that extra help when you're carrying legislation. That makes sense. Connect with the stakeholders that have a lot of firsthand knowledge that, yeah, partnerships are important for passing bills. I appreciate well, that, and, Sarah. And, and, all, and also having the depart, your Department of Transportation at the table because we did tweak the bill uh, to their satisfaction. So they they knew it was a workable, a workable solution. And we're really excited to see what transpires. And of course, you mentioned to the public private partnerships and um, some of what's going on in Michigan, which Carol mentioned earlier, there's also an initiative in Florida, which I know we both learned about before, but some interesting models to get Uber and Lyft and other private providers um, involved. So it sounds like that's part of what you're maybe hoping will come out of this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we'll keep an eye on that. We will definitely be checking back in. It'll be fun to have a check-in session in a year or two to see how things are moving along. We do have a question from the audience, so let me ask this. And um, not sure who would be best equipped to answer. I'm guessing Carol might have um, some thoughts on this. The question is from Kara Wilson. It's how might ADA liability be apportioned between different levels of government? In other words, you know, county, state, et cetera which may all have some responsibility for accessible transportation infrastructure. Carol, do you have any thoughts on that or any models of how that's been done before? Uh, hi everyone, this is Carol. Um, I don't, that's a good question. Um, I can share, um, I was really excited to find the MassDOT uh, sidewalk and curb cut survey to see a state doing that work on its own. Because quite honestly, a lot of the work in the most recent years to improve infrastructure has come from lawsuits <laughs> so, or really bad press. So, um, and But I, I do know in Kansas City, um, there were some uh, uh, bike and pedestrian advocates that worked with the disability community. Uh, to, and I think it was um, a ballot initiative, and I think they raised funds that way to improve the sidewalks there. So that, that's a one good example. I really wanted it to be a statewide, but, but it's not, but that's one good example. So. Okay, thanks for that. Any thoughts, Sarah or Senator Massey? Um, I think I think it's been covered well, and and you just kind of have to look at the resources in your state and build partnerships and and work together on it. But I think the assessment that was mentioned is a is a great idea too, and try to encourage that in your state. I agree. That's it. Serious undertaking, Dustin. Are you? Let's let's see, Dustin. Are you on the phone with us? Can you un Can you unmute? Can you hear us? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Dustin. Let's How you doing? Uh, ask you a quick question. Can you tell us a little bit about your advocacy work in New York City in terms of maybe a particular success story that you've been, that you've been part of, or maybe maybe something that's an ongoing um, work towards trying to get towards a success? Is there a story you could quickly share with us? Well, we've had definite um, success in the past couple of years. I've been advocating since uh, 2013. We've had um, success when it comes to our TLC taxi system, where 50% um, of our yellow taxis are accessible right now for people with disabilities and those who need them. Uh, we have 100% accessibility on our buses, and we now have um, low floor buses on 100% of our local lines, which is something really good. Um, the last time we had ramps, they would get stuck and people would have to go through a really challenging ways to get off the bus. 
And, you know, having low floor buses 100% is really changing the game. We're looking to add um, low floor coach buses as well. Um, that's definitely going to be very helpful. Um, I'm trying to think. We've, we've done um, changes with police stations, um, courthouses, uh, curb cuts we're still working on, um, Metro North. You know, everything was pretty good. Okay. Thank you for that. A lot going on there. And I know, yeah, yeah, appreciate your efforts doing that. And I know there's some things that are still definitely not great there, the, the elevator access and the subways, but appreciate you sharing that. Um, yeah, we're still working on that, but, you know, or, it's a slow burn. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, so we do just have one more minute. So I think we will wrap up in a moment if we do not have any more questions. I want to thank Dustin, Carol, Sarah, Sarah Massey for joining us and participating. I know sometimes the technology associated with this is quite an undertaking to get to this point. So I appreciate we all being at this point and you taking the time and my colleagues at NCSL assisting um, and the folks with ReadyTalk. And I really do think this is an important topic and one at NCSL we're committing to kind of continuing to do research and have conversations around. I do want to note that we do have one more webinar in our series tomorrow at one o'clock Eastern again. Uh, that's the ADA's impact on accessible legislatures. So talking about what legislatures themselves gonna to have to do. Uh, state capitol buildings are obviously um, most times very old and were not built with ADA um, in mind when they were built. So how do you deal with that? So speakers from the Texas and Wyoming legislatures will detail some of their recent renovations and how they were able to use those renovations as opportunities to um, come in compliance with ADA. Um, so that will be tomorrow. So on behalf of everyone at NCSL, thank you very much. Stay safe. Thank you for participating in this today. Um, and we will see each other again soon. Take care.